Thank you for joining the Justice Project. The South Bay area stands on ancestral indigenous land. The Ohlone Indian tribes once called this home. Now their spirit and descendants remain. Uh, the current pandemic has unearthed some of the trauma that separated the Ohlone from their homeland. People of color face similar housing equity and justice issues today. Listen to local voices as they share how moral courage can transform housing and homelessness in the Santa Clara County. Interact directly with change makers who stand up for policy that impacts our most vulnerable population. I'm Reverend Ray, the Executive Director for PAC, People Acting in Community Together in Santa Clara County. We are a multi-faith, multicultural organization who develop leaders to speak truth to power. We push for policies that drive economic, racial, and criminal justice for all. We stand for human rights for immigrants. We stand for affordable housing and police accountability. We push elected officials to transform unjust systems so everyone receives the same equity and quality of life. PAC and over 100 local faith leaders are standing witness to protect our most vulnerable population and the frontline workers we serve, who serve us most of all. Right now, I'd like to offer a, an opening blessing and prayer and then introduce our panel. Uh, as we come into this sacred place, uh, this borrowed land that we call home, we do stand on the sacrifices made by others. We are eternally grateful that we are all able to come together from different races, different cultures, different faces, uh, faiths uh, to combat this COVID-19 pandemic with courage, with grace, with love, with honor. So in this space, we invite the spirit of love as we seek to move in solidarity for the purpose of winning this battle. Shalom and peace, we say to all. Welcome again, everyone, to uh, this Justice Project. And as we begin, I'd like to check in with some of our uh, very dedicated leaders within the Santa Clara County uh, area. Uh, I'd like to start off by welcoming uh, my friend Pancho. And Pancho, tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization, and what has given you gas and fuel during this pandemic. Um, thank you, Reverend Ray. Uh, my name is Poncho Guevara. I'm the Executive Director of Sacred Heart Community Service here in San Jose, which is a grassroots anti-poverty organization that does everything from providing direct needs to tens of thousands of folks that are struggling in our community, but also um, is an organizing partner with uh, with organizations like PACT and others that are fighting, that are on the fight around tenant rights and immigrant rights and, and, um, and police accountability. And so what's giving me fuel right now is this uh, intense frustration and anger around um, the fact that our community um, that is responding to this COVID-19 crisis um, is turning its back on some of the most critical members of our community, specifically undocumented folks who are not part of the public safety net in any meaningful way and are have been some of the folks that have been most dramatically impacted by this. So I think it is that righteous anger that, that keeps me focused and, and the realization that we can't do it. No one organization or even a smaller coalition of organizations, but a larger one is really necessary for us to step up and making sure that we're able to address these issues, not just in terms of service, which is fine and charity is meaningful, but it's what we can do around the policy front. So I'm, I'm eager to have more of this conversation about what we need to be doing collectively to fight for um, for collective power for our immigrant community members that are um, that that are the most vulnerable right now from being displaced um, and shoved into homelessness by this uh, pandemic. Ashe and thank you, Pancho. And now we'd like to welcome to our panel our brother Robert Aguirre. Robert, tell us about uh, yourself, what you do, and what's giving you fuel right now during this pandemic. And you're going to have to uh, unmute yourself, Robert. There we go. It's loud your head if you can hear me. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit, Robert. Just keep talking and hopefully you'll get into that good spot. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so uh, I'm a houseless advocate, having been unhoused myself for uh, off and on for over 20 years. And uh, because of that, I have a real heart for this condition, for people that find themselves in this situation. And one of the things that uh, has got, you know, has me really focused on this is the fact that we have uh, so much attention to our um, the stimulus money. We have uh, uh, um, unemployment benefits, we have bailouts, we have all kinds of stuff for people that are on the edge right now of falling off the cliff. But what I'm concerned about are people that are already at the bottom of the cliff that have been at the bottom of the cliff all along. And they're, they're getting crushed by people that are falling off the cliff, cliff. And those people are the ones that are getting attention. But the people that have been long-term unhoused are continuing to be uh, discriminated against. And I would like to see that change. That, that to me is what is driving me more than anything else. I say, and thank you, Robert, for dialing in and uh, sharing your perspective. Right now, we'd like to welcome Sharon. Sharon, tell us about yourself and what's given you gas during this pandemic. Hello, thank you. Yes, I'm um, the director of Catholic Charities Cathedral Social Ministries, located at John the 23rd. For most uh, everyone here, you've known us as being at the cathedral for the past 30, 30 years. However, here we are, and we're happy to be here working um, in partnership with Catholic Charities, the window, uh, for those of you who don't know, the window is a, a window that is open to any individual who's in a homeless situation where they can receive mail. We have 1,200 individuals who are registered who receive mail. We see 150 people a day. We are certainly on the, on the front line. And uh, with the stimulus checks, these last uh, two weeks, we've been able to, at least from the CARES Act, uh, the stimulus checks, we've been able to get 130 checks into people's hands, and uh, along with their unemployment checks and uh, service navigation to the hotline uh, shelter. We're making phone calls for those homeless individuals who don't have a, have a phone, and uh, what do we have? We have 1,200 beds. I am so impressed with what the city of San Jose and the county offices of supportive housing has done in terms of creating these these beds um, in, in such a quick quick effort and another hundred come online this next week bringing us to 1300 beds. Uh, certainly never enough and, and then how do we transition to not just opening those shelters and those individuals to the street and making sure we can um, implement a, a transition into transitional housing and, and our continuum of care and coordinated assessment process and seeing those efforts actually work. The, um, and then um, certainly in terms of our healthcare clinic with Gardner here on site, the homeless healthcare um, program is still with us. We're integrated in including our reentry services. Uh, working with the criminal justice system, our faith-based reentry services, uh, working with those that are released um, from jail and, uh, and housing them as, as, as quick as we can. I'm thankful for the case managers we have. Everyone is working 100 miles an hour. And then most recently, the state, uh, the disaster uh, uh, um, recovery assistance for, for immigrants. And that was, oh my goodness, that was uh, three days ago when we first started, the, the over a thousand phone calls coming in and the, and the line crashed and, and then we needed to rebuild the line. And, and uh, we've averaged 400 calls a day now in the last three days. And uh, we've, um, since we started um, three days ago, we, we have 998 applicants submitted um, and this will this will keep going for another six weeks and then just the resiliency that's what keeps me going in terms of the people we're serving the faith um, being centered in, in God and humanity I, I really am um, the people we serve humble me they humble me every day in terms of of um, their support of one another and their faith um, Yes, we're in this together. Excellent. Ashe, and thank you, Sharon. All right, Brother Michael, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization, and what's given you gas 
uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, and thank you to, to you and Pat for um, having me on the panel. Um, I'm a staff attorney in a housing program at the Law Foundation. I'm also a member of our steering committee on our uh, race, equity, and inclusion initiative. So um, the Law Foundation, we're the largest legal services provider in Santa Clara County. We provide services related to health, um, children and youth, and housing. Um, and we've really uh, um, you know, given our, our best shot to continue all of those services to the, the most extent we can uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm really um, you know, fortunate and, and grateful to be part of a staff that has uh, done a lot of work to continue reaching out to, to our clients, to um, you know, continue serving them at a high level, and to continue to support um, you know, organizing and policy campaigns that um, are absolutely critical to advancing uh, social justice in Santa Clara County. Um, so we've done a, a lot of work to support organizations like PACT, like Sacred Heart, um, and, and a, a many of our other partners in pushing for uh, very important legal changes uh, during this time. So we supported um, San Jose's and Santa Clara County's eviction moratoria. And those are uh, policies that um, are really the only thing keeping people in their homes while um, you know, so many tenants have lost income uh, due to the county public health order that, that's now in effect. Um, we're continuing to support uh, what we see as a um, you know very much a community-led demand for a cancellation of rent uh, and mortgages in Santa Clara County, and um, are looking forward to a June third meeting at the um, uh, Board of Supervisors Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force meeting to you know continue um, pushing for that that rent cancellation. And um, I should say that you know what what is really giving me fuel in this time is is just working with um, community organizers, with tenants themselves, um, who are really using their voices in a very impactful way. And it's been inspiring to see um, people speaking truth to power, and and also you know highlighting not only the the difficulties we're facing now, but the the history of um, you know injustice and um, inequitable policies that are creating many of the disparities that um, the COVID-19 pandemic is, is having. Um, so we um, have a letter with uh, many other community-based organizations and uh, along with Sacred Heart um, asking Santa Clara County to, to better track those disparities and, and to publish more data on who is getting tested, who is COVID-19, and, and who's had the worst um, health outcomes from COVID-19. And that information is critically important to, to us um, in going forward and, and advancing um, equity as, as um, efforts to rebuild from this crisis go forward. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Ashe. And what gives me fuel is having the four of you here join us here uh, in solidarity to address the issues and ultimately come up with outcomes to make sure that our most vulnerable and impacted uh, are taken care of. So uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, from the Cal Matters, the average unemployment benefit is around 2,500. And as you know, rent eats up the majority of that unemployment. Let's dive into it and talk about uh, what renters are up uh, facing at the end of May. After seven weeks of staying at, stay at home, more than 200,000 Santa Clara locals are jobless and um, have joined in the call for rent cancellation uh, and for forgiveness of evictions. Uh, well, I'll start with you, Michael. Uh, what, what can we do to help protect those renters that are on the edge right now? So there's a number of things that um, that local government can do, and I think that um, the public and communities have an important role in in pushing for local these protections um, at with local governments. Um, so first is like you said, just the cancellation of rent. Um, this is a obligation that 
unemployment insurance and even CARES Act benefits are not going to be sufficient um, to cover. And families that are um, facing that shortfall are um, you know, not going to have a, a way to pay back that rent at the same time that they're resuming their normal rent payments um, once the more eviction, eviction moratorium lifts. You know, another needed protection would, would be to just say that that back rent that's owed can never be the basis for eviction. And, um, you know, that would still uh, allow the landlord to, to seek that debt through a civil action, but would really, you know, avoid and prevent the risk of displacement um, as a result of, of that unpaid back rent. Um, so those are things we're pushing for, um, you know, at, at the county level. Um, and, uh, you know, community members, I think, have an important role to play in, in supporting those tenants and asking for those policies. I think outreach is also critically important right now. And we're seeing that, um, you know, tenants who don't know about the eviction moratorium in place and some of their protections that they have um, are, are being forced into bad payment plans or, or even, you know, convinced to, to voluntarily leave by landlords. And of course, that's that's heartbreaking for us to see when you know, tenants are in that situation, they do have the opportunity to be protected and, and simply aren't because of a lack of information. So I hope that people are, you know, connecting with their neighbors to the extent possible and letting them know that there are protections in place and um, that folks should be seeking legal assistance if they're, they're um, feeling that their housing is jeopardized during this time. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Now, Pancho, tell us some of the things that you're hearing and experiencing relational to uh, the ensuing potential eviction and the end of the rent moratorium. Yeah, uh, thank you, Reverend. Um, w one of the things that we saw immediately when this crisis began, we, we were getting prepared to launch a financial assistance program for, um, for individuals that were impacted by the COVID-19 you know, crisis. And, and we've launched that the week, of, um, uh, the week of March 23rd. And within, similar to what Sharon was describing, within the first 18 hours, we got over, over uh, nearly 5,000 applications for assistance. In the first 18 hours that we had, um, um, we had our systems up and we got, you know, 3,000, you know, like 3,000 calls in, in the first um, day and a half just to be able to, you know, put it in perspective. And, and over the last month and a half, we've had 18,000 people apply for assistance. So we've gotten through the first 12 million um, and we're getting ready to ramp up a new, uh, a, a new program that's going to be launching uh, this week with folks trying to reach some of the folks that were on our interest list, but this is going to be targeted and documented um, households that are extremely low income. But the, the thing that's keeping people in place is exactly what Michael was talking about, the eviction you know, uh, moratorium that was in place. And what we're working with and what we're hearing from the folks is that they are, um, they are desperate. They are struggling to try to make ends meet. They need to put food on the table. The thing that's keeping them in their places is eviction moratorium. Um, but we're even hearing tragic stories of folks that are that because they don't have a, a um, they're renting a room from someone and they're being pushed. They're not the traditional means, but they're being kicked out of where they're, where they're staying because they don't have the money and people are, are, are doing this and there aren't a lot of protections for them. And this just speaks to the cataclysm that we're facing in the next few months, unless we could actually do some things, um, very, uh, very concrete things. Michael mentioned this, but we would, but, but the idea that um, our organizers and our leaders um, from our um, housing committee and our, and our um, homeless um, committee, um, uh, survivors of the streets, are working on right now is trying to push the county, uh, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors to extend the moratorium to the end of 2020 and give renters at least until the end of uh, December 2021 to make up that lost rent and being able to do that. And, and if there are other ways that these that, that these debts can be used civilly, as Michael described, it would be really critical. But the tools that we have at our disposal uh, may be limited in terms of cancellation at a local level. But state lawmakers should be working to cancel or pay rent for tenants that are affected by the COVID crisis with, um, and then also working with landlords, especially some of the um, small, you know, smaller landlords that don't have other things, giving them the opportunity to do some mortgage forgiveness or being able to, you know, uh, put them into forbearance or being do some other things to make sure that that's that that is happening because we know that there, there are some good players out there along with some others that are looking to take advantage of this particular moment. Um, but really federal officials have to use their powers to, to really forgive rent and mortgage debt, you know, over, over the long haul. And that's something that we're, that we're looking at. It's certainly part of the efforts that are happening at the, um, as part of the 
um, the most recent wave of stimulus legislation that has been discussed um, you know, but, and passed by the House to be able to do some homelessness prevention work and real investment there. But ultimately, if we're not um, super aggressive right now at, at trying to make sure that, that we're preventing people from being just massively displaced by some uh, major forgiveness, extending these moratoriums and making sure that non-payment of rent is not the basis that, uh, um, that for, uh, for their displacement from this community, we know uh, what's going to happen. It was like, I think Robert was said it very well. Like we were in a bad situation to begin. There were a lot of people that were struggling, especially those, our brothers and sisters that have been unhoused for some time. Um, now the, the level of cataclysm that we're looking at and so many other folks joining um, those ranks um, are really, uh, really on that precipice right now. Thank you, Pancho. Sharon, per, per the San Jose Mercury, I mean, people are desperate and the demand for release relief in these areas are increasing. And I share um, your experience uh, around the central idea of desperateness and uh, the increased demand relief and some of your experiences that you're seeing here in, in the county. Certainly, um, in terms of the, the homeless and the 150 individuals we see on a, a daily basis, um, uh, 1,200 registered yet, we, we see on a, a, at least a daily Bases, 15 new people a day, and um, the um, desperation of it could be the domestic violence. It, it could be they just they were just pushed out of um, the place they were living in, and then those that are just so hungry, trying to stay housed, and then the efforts Catholic Charities is um, supporting in terms of the seven churches that we now have that are providing food seven days a week, uh, 500 cars a day driving through these uh, churches uh, throughout the Catholic um, diocese and uh, all being um, supported through efforts through Catholic charities. And uh, it's so sad to see um, on a, on a, every, every day we see 120 cars that are told we just ran out of food. And that's how desperate the people are for food, just so that they, we can try to keep them housed and they can make rent. Um, these are um, challenging times. And at the same time, in terms of desperation, I, I, I really just wanna support our advocacy efforts. Uh, we really need to 100% uh, um, support um, what's gonna keep people um, housed and not evicted and supporting efforts like the Silicon Valley at home and uh, the, 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 the HEROES Act um, and stabilization um, with uh, this next wave of monies that, that need to include rental monies to keep people housed. Just, uh, yes. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Sharon. Hey, Robin, are you there? Can you hear me? Robert. Yes, I can hear you. All right, we can hear you. Hey, Robert, speak to uh, some of the, uh, the effects that um, we're talking about uh, and its impact uh, in the homeless area and some of the promises that were made and some of the things that are missing. Yeah, um, uh, first I wanna start off by uh, sharing that uh, a group of us referred to that window as the window of opportunity. Uh, because it does give people a chance to get their meals, people a chance to get uh, a sandwich or sometimes something to drink or eat. It's, 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 it's a nice thing there. But um, in, the, in the big picture, it, it's only a little piece of it and only a few people get to take advantage of that. What I'm talking about here is that we have large numbers of people that need to get housed. Uh, the city doesn't like people living outdoors. I don't like people living outdoors. I don't think anybody likes people like living outdoors, including the people that are living outdoors, but there's not enough housing available. There wasn't before uh, COVID-19 and, and there isn't now. The fact that they're claiming that they've got all these housing uh, units, or hotels or motels or, or even shelter spaces, uh, first of all, they're, they're not sufficient for the number of people. The um, housing department has handed over the responsibility of housing these folks to the um, to the county, 
and uh, the county is responsible now for all the people. So we're talking about almost 10,000 people. So if we have a thousand people in the county that have been housed, not just San Jose, but that's the entire county, and we have 10,000 people, we're, we're not doing a very good job. Uh, the other thing is that uh, people that, that get into some of these housing are told that they can only be there for a limited amount of time. They're going to have to leave. And they're going to bring more people in to just keep that door revolving. And they keep counting the people. So if, if you've been in one location, for example, if you were at uh, Roosevelt Park Community Center, and then you get moved from there uh, to um, the uh, park side, you get counted twice. You get counted once for moving into uh, the uh, community center, again for moving into Parkside. If it turns out that you are positive, you test positive, they move you to a third place, you get counted again. And if you become extremely ill where they have to ho hospitalize you, then you get moved a fourth time. So they're counting that same person four times. So the number of people that get passed isn't necessarily what the, the true number that we're seeing. And I know some people that have been played moved around like a chess piece and uh, they don't feel like they have any real support from the county or the city in providing them the kind of security that they need. Uh, at first they were just forcing people in, they weren't being spaced apart, they weren't providing people with uh, matter or gloves or, or anything for that matter, including hand sanitizer. Then that started to happen, but yet we still have people that are too close to one another. For example, Parkside. You have a uh, space there for a hundred and I forget hundred and something people, but they are less than 50% of the, of the capacity. And yet those people, can you imagine people that are going crazy in their homes? At least they can get up, go to the bathroom when they want. They can go to uh, the refrigerator and make themselves something to eat on the stove or the oven. They can do all those things. But if you're in a shelter, you got to go outside to use a porta potty for one. You don't have a you don't have a, a living room that you can sit around and watch TV or Netflix or anything else. You don't have a lot of the things. You're forced to stay in a single space all day long, and you don't have the in and out privileges that you and I enjoy. Being able to go out, go to the grocery store, or just go to the park and have a have a little peace of mind. So we're not really addressing the problem, and uh, it's just going to get worse as more and more people are being pushed out of their homes and into the streets. Thank you, Robert. But let, let's continue, and it's a great transition. Uh, based on some reports by uh, Santa Clara County, COVID-19 have really affected uh, people of color the most, with some of the highest numbers being shown by our Latinx brothers and sisters. Uh, relational to housing, um, I'll start with you, Pancho. Have we seen any racial inequities in relationship to housing and homelessness? homelessness? impacting our Latinx brothers and sisters? Yeah, absolutely. There was a recent study that was, uh, that was compiled uh, for the continuum of, of care around, around homeless assistance that was um, done by Destination Home, kind of looking at racial inequities in our system. And they are dramatic, um, at Reverend. They, we we're seeing not only the folks that have, that have traditionally accessed the resources, disproportionately and African American and Native American, you know, individuals that are um, heavily overrepresented in our systems relative to the general population. And that's been true for uh, forever. And it speaks to what, what's actually really happening right now when we see um, the numbers in terms of COVID cases, the number of folks that are uh, that, that have experienced death in our community. Um, these are the social determinants of poverty. I mean, it's, it's just coming, uh, rearing its ugly head right now. And we're actually seeing it play out because where you were born, the color of your skin plays a big difference in terms of the economic opportunities, your housing opportunities, the, the crowding that happens, the neighborhoods that you're allowed to live in that you can be able to afford to be able to do it, your employment opportunities, um, and especially the the overrepresentation of people of color in uh, in the essential workforce as we see it right now. Those that are taking care of you know, taking care of our facilities, taking care of uh, like feeding us, um, and um, and and playing these roles and these essential things. They're they're um, uh, the Latinx population in particular is putting themselves at a much higher risk. Um, in addition to having these other these other issues, but when it comes to housing and homelessness, it's always been there, and it's only uh, precipitating you know more. And I think I I mentioned this before, but the 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 level of of need that we're seeing because um, so many of our undocumented brothers and sisters are not eligible for things like the CARES Act, 
uh, they're not eligible for either stimulus payments or eligible for unemployment. Um, and for many of them who are not able to work right now, they've lost, so many have lost their employment or had it cut, even if those are working in, in other um, in essential um, industries. Their ability to be able to make the rent is has been has been cut dramatically, and if not for the the moratorium, they would be facing you know just mass eviction. But once the rent comes due, if we're not looking at a grace period longer than 120 days, which was built into um, um, some some of these particular um, a moratorium language, um, we're going to be looking at so many more just being displaced, uh, kicked out, and and rooted out of our community, and they've been part of our our, our community and our economy for generations. So it is something that we are extremely concerned about. And also when you look at housing, you asked the question about housing, we're not building enough housing, we're building enough or creating enough housing to begin with. And so in addition to whether it's 10,000, um, our committee is pushing for 5,000 um, units, that's uh, temporary shelter spaces in, in the county by the end of the year to help meet some of these things, uh, these needs. We are gonna see um, just a giant, um, uh, like pushing out of communities of color it, um, as the only things that the market has been able to do and they've only emphasized building market rate, very expensive housing that's really not accessible to people of color in our valley, in our community. And, and we're very concerned about that, but we, we know that, we, that this is a fight that's been here long before and it's gonna be here long after the, this uh, pandemic. Great. Now, now, Michael, how do we, in, in the context of this question, how do we protect the most vulnerable considering it's the people of color that are most impacted uh, with uh, during this pandemic, and, and those are impacted relational to housing and uh, unsheltered. Yeah, th that's a great question, and, and I appreciate Pancho's um, response as to the underlying issues. I mean, these are long-standing, um, or the issue, the disparities that we're seeing now are the results of long-standing uh, policy choices that. Um, you know, reflect serious racial inequity. Um, so, uh, you know, in San, San Jose, we see that the neighborhoods now most affected by um, COVID-19, this disparate impact, are the ones that were redlined through much of the 20th century. And um, then, you know, were uh, displaced and, and affected by redevelopment later on. So, you know, this ongoing history and, and um, continued set of choices around housing policy that um, you know, favors uh, some groups and leaves others to the uh, kind of health and poverty outcomes that that we've seen is is absolutely unacceptable. And um, you know, it's it's time that uh, we lift that history up and call for a different approach going forward. And I think now is is the time to to make those demands and reflecting on what um, Robert was saying, I, I think now's the time to call for, for housing to be a human right in California. And I think, um, you know, there's an opportunity through the COVID-19 crisis to see um, that that's doable. You know, we are making a lot of temporary housing available at a very quick rate and at a rate that we said was impossible before this crisis began. I think that, um, you know, we really need to think bigger about um, what we can do, uh, you know, as a community, as a, a state, to um, make sure that these patterns of racial inequity aren't repeated. Um, I think on a, a more immediate um, basis, I mean, I, I think it's, it is just a really important that people outre do outreach and then connect with their neighbors and let them know about the protections they have um, unfortunately, many um, in many monolingual Spanish speakers in, in our community are being um, approached by by landlords and har harassed and pressed into um, you know bad payment plans or being told to leave um, you know without going through the proper process. And um, so it's it's really critical that those those people know um, that they have rights, that they can get assistance, and that you know we're um, here to help, um, not just us, but of course, you know, Sacred Heart and then and the other entire network of organizations here, um, you know, serving uh, our community. Thank you, Michael. Well, great. Let's transition. This next question is for Robert and Sharon. Um, 
The question is, more than 9,700 homeless are homeless in Santa Clara County, with San Jose being the city with more than 6,000 vulnerable locals seeking relief and testing during this pandemic. The tent near Cesar Chavez Park is half full, as many of the unhoused worry about their things and safety. Um, how do we support the unsheltered when we lack basics for their survival? Only 800 beds per night in San Jose, 6,000 homeless, only six public restrooms downtown, restaurants are not allowing uh, all locals inside, and libraries are closed. 6,000 homeless. So Robert, what, what do we do? How do we support the unsheltered and Sharon? Uh, I would say one of the things that uh, I think is critical that I've been calling for with the city and the county is that we need to have uh, a commission, just like we have an airport commission, and we have a senior citizens commission, and we have every kind of commission you can think of, but we don't have a commission that represents the people that are unhoused or the poor. And these are the people that are constantly being uh, subjected to uh, criminalization and you know every kind of discrimination you can think of, I mean, like you pointed out about the restrooms. and. Uh, there are a lot of re restaurants, even before this, that wouldn't allow people to go in to use a restroom. And uh, the other thing is that there's no real uh, system out there for addressing people that have mental illnesses. And uh, it's not the majority of people, uh, but it is a group of people that do need this extra extra care. And typically, the people that respond to them are not that understand how to treat them uh, fairly or even treat them medically. Uh, so we get a lot of people that, that get attacked or, or get in jail or get put in different places that, that, are, that don't really give them the treatments that they need. And uh, we have to recognize that even um, addictions are illnesses and they need to be treated as such and not, not as a criminal. And um, as far as uh, the people that are being tested, um, I feel that the county and the city look at the unhoused as COVID chum. In other words, they're just out there and, and there's nothing that's really being done for them. Out of the uh, nearly 10,000 people in the county, only 200 have been tested. And the thing that I got to say is that if you're asymptomatic, you don't know if you're carrying it. You don't know who you are going to affect and you don't know how that effect is going to go further down as, as it, like a chain reaction. So we need to uh, step up the, the, the uh, uh, notifying people that don't have phones, that don't have radios, that don't have televisions, that don't have any other way of getting this information but by word of mouth, we need to step up and provide more outreach. And by the way, the city and the county have stopped doing outreach altogether. So there is no more outreach coming from the city or the county. And we need to uh, let people know what their options are. They don't even know that they can go out and request this uh, stimulus money. And so the money's just sitting out there and they're not knowing how to, how to get it. And for a lot of these people, they would be able to get money even for three days in a hotel. That's three days that you can shower. There's three days that you can you know, rest comfortably knowing that your things aren't gonna get stolen. That's, that's a lot of sanity that you're buying with uh, $1,200. And uh, just to not give people the opportunity to have access to a lot of things that all of us take for granted is to me is criminal. I'll leave it at that. Right on, Robert. Thank you for sharing. Very powerful, very impactful. Sharon. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Sharon, so we can hear your thoughts. Hello. <laughs> yes, so go. my response is um, in terms of um, homelessness, um, the reason we have it is there, is, there aren't enough homes. Uh, clearly, uh, we wouldn't have homelessness if if we were serving the most vulnerable and protecting our communities and making sure everyone is housed. We've failed miserably in the last, um, oh my goodness, most especially the last 15 years. Uh, however, I, I do want to applaud the Law Foundation when we have a, a, a pit count, a, a point in time count that shows 40% of our homeless population do have a mental health condition. And, and I'm thankful the Law Foundation is there to navigate and to walk with those individuals and, and, and to provide the services they need to, to, to re-enter housing again and to support them. And we just don't have enough supportive housing. We just don't. 
Uh, I'd also like to applaud Cindy Chavez and um, uh, our mayor and, and, um, and uh, certainly some other um, uh, civic members who have really gone above and beyond to try to address these, these problems that we currently have. Um, we currently do have street outreach workers. And um, do we have enough during COVID? We, are, we never have enough, uh, whether it's COVID or it's not COVID. And um, I am, would like to applaud the staff here within social ministries uh, in terms of working with um, those on the street in the window and, and, uh, and keeping the office open on holidays. We will be closed for the first time on a holiday this Memorial Day. I, I, I need to give our staff a break. Um, they are they are working nonstop and working closely with the Office of Supportive Housing and helping to place individuals in in the um, shelters that we do have. And my biggest concern is going to be how do we transition once um, we are not um, placing people in in shelters the way we are right now. The um, we need to make sure that that transition happens where we start doing the coordinated assessment process and what are we going to do because there is not enough housing. Excellent, thank you, Sharon, and thank you all for your wonderful response. Wonderful responses. I think you've, uh, we're on borrowed time. Uh, I want to take about uh, the next five minutes to take a few questions from uh, those who are watching live with us. We have a question. Um, from Pastor Sammy of the Stone Church, and either of my, any one of my panelists can answer this question. The question is, how can we, and hi Sammy, and thank you for joining us, and all of those who are joining us live on Facebook. I failed to mention that earlier. Um, how can we get the word out about uh, renter's rights? How uh, can we get the word out to our community about renter's rights? I can uh, take a stab at that. So, um, you know, we, I did, first I want to thank um, PACT for hosting this panel and, and for all its leadership and, and coordinating among the faith community. Um, you know, I think that faith communities do have an incredibly important role uh, to play in, in letting uh, your members know that, um, you know, protections exist and um, legal help exists. Um, so, you know, there, there aren't very many um, of the uh, typical meeting places or organizations, uh, you know, physical places where people are gathering like we did, like we had before um, COVID-19. And, and, you know, faith-based services uh, occurring virtually are, are one of the kind of few ways that people are, are coming together right now. So that's, that's a really, you know, critical opportunity to just let, know, let people know that, that help is out there, that, um, you know, that there is, some protection against evictions right now, and um, that people should seek help if they need it. Um, we're always uh, willing to do, uh, you know, individual presentations, know your rights presentations um, about the eviction moratorium, about general um, tenants' rights, about fair housing, you know, anything housing related. Um, you let us get a little time that, that works for. Um, your members, uh, so that the people know, um, know how they're protected. Excellent. Thank I would you, just, Michael. I would Go just ahead. add one other thing, um, is that this is a critical time for folks. There's one thing to understand what the rights are, if that was the nature of the question, but if it's about how you can stand up for it, this is a critical time to be contacting lawmakers, specifically the County Board of Supervisors, talking to our state representatives, um, but, but particularly uh, the County Board of Supervisors and also our city council members in, in the cities where, where you're located in and reinforcing with them, we need to be able to have, we need to extend these moratorium, we need to extend this moratorium and extend some of these protections because they're hearing from folks, they're hearing from landlords that are saying, we don't wanna see you know, these, uh, they're, they're talking about their suffering um, and that suffering may be real, but being able to push them and write letters and say, we need to do something about it. It's your time to be able to use whatever privilege and, and, and security that you have and put it on the line for others and making sure that we're able to extend these moratoriums and extend the payback time and, and advance whatever, in whatever mechanisms we can to cancel rents. That is really critical right now. Excellent. Well, listen, I want to respect and honor your time. We're going to close out here. 
I want to thank all of us for joining and creating uh, time uh, for the Justice Project. Uh, we are coming together to create uh, a different California and a stronger and more united and new improved Silicon Valley. Uh, next week, next Thursday, we want you to join us for our subject, Economic Justice in the Face of COVID-19. So I want to remind you, you can go to our Facebook page and get information about census. We wanna make sure that if you have questions about the census, that you're able to get your questions answered and also encourage all of your friends and families to complete their census. And we want to make sure that everyone is prepared for voting. Uh, voting by mail perhaps will be the best way to vote this week, this year. So voter engagement is very important. Uh, and then lastly, the HEROES Act. On our Facebook page, there's information about the HEROES Act. You can sign up, you can register, and you can participate. So in parting, uh, I'd like to give each one of our panelists 30 seconds to tell our listeners and to tell uh, individuals who support your organization what can they do to help? So close this out. We'll start with Michael. What can people do to help? Well, one of the most important things to, to do right now is, is what Pancho said and, and use your voice. You know, let elected officials know that more help is needed, that without further action, we are going to see widespread evictions. We're, we are going to see an increase in homelessness um, as a result of this crisis. So it's, it's urgent that those messages get into um, our elected officials. Of course, um, also just letting people know about their rights, letting people know they have rights, and um, getting them connected to, to assistance where that's possible. Us, of course, um, we're, we're always happy to work with folks and, and do trainings, as I mentioned. Um, so please, please get in touch. Sharon, what can they do to help? I would certainly recommend individuals to visit the Catholic Charities website um, page, and there are many ways um, uh, to be involved uh, through, through Catholic Charities, from advocacy to volunteering directly and uh, supporting oh, just so many, so many efforts. Um, and, uh, and helping to navigate how to um, advocate because that can be quite um, daunting. Uh, however, um, I, I feel our web page is, uh, is pretty amazing and, and it will help navigate the average person in terms of how to, how to be engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Robert, what can they do to help my brother? Unmute yourself, Robert. There we go. All right. Um, so I think we have to be aware of the new economy that's going to be hitting us. And we have a lot of businesses that are going under because they can't afford to stay in business. And a lot of those businesses are landlords. They're small mom and pops. And what happened uh, during the uh, 2008 uh, crisis, uh, we had a lot of um, big corporations come in and buy single family homes and buy up apartments and then jacked up the rent on them and they, or knocked them down and built something new and uh, started shrinking our um, affordable housing by doing so. I think we're gonna face the same sort of thing now when uh, mom and pop start going under and big corporate comes along with some money and says, I'd like to buy you out. And of course they're gonna sell out. And of course the rents are gonna go up and we're gonna have even fewer housing. So I'd leave it at that. I'd also like to add um, my little saying is that don't do more than you can do, do all you can Thank do. Thank you, Robert. And last but not least, Punch, so what can they do? What can we do to help? Don't lose hope. It's time Don't to fight. Hope. We have, there, there's, um, there are so many things that we have and, and there's so much strength that we have and collective power that we have. And if we cower in the face of it, it it's an overwhelming time. It's a time that tears us up in terms of our, our physical and mental you know, health and well-being. But, but for those of us that have power, privilege, and, and we have a responsibility to make sure that that our unhoused brother and sisters are, you know, the tenants, the undocumented, other, other folks that um, that stand the most to lose, can hear from you um, by by getting involved, by contact elected officials, by volunteering, by by making donations, whatever it is that you can do. But use your voice because it, it's power that will save us. Excellent. Again, I welcome you and thank you for joining in this Justice Project. Michael, Sharon, Pancho, and Robert, we appreciate your sacrifice, your time, your dedication to our community. 
and I pray blessings over all of you and give you thanks for spending time with us. We'll see you again uh, next week, same time, same place, the Justice Project as we talk about economic justice. Thank you all for joining us.